What's up everyone, it's a knife saw here and today I'm going to be doing my annual knife collection update. I do this one every year and so today on New Year's Day, the most overrated holiday of the year, I'm going to be showing you guys all of my knives. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my more expensive knives and then move to my more budget knives because I figured for the people who just want to, um, you know, stay here a couple minutes and then move on with their life. I understand that. And so you don't want to have to sit through all the cheaper knives to get to the actual nice ones. But um, anyway, here is my first knife on the list. The Chris Reeve Knives Large Sabenza 21 with an Insingo blade in black micarta handles. And I'm just going to say a little snippet, I guess, about every single knife. I'll try to include the price if I can remember it. But um, the Sabenza, it's a knife that it's very hard to just talk about it a little bit. Um, I feel like if I just talk about it a little bit, you're going to be coming away thinking that it's absurdly overpriced. But it's a very well-built knife made in America. This in single blade in S35VN is a very functional, probably my favorite blade shape out there. The handles are very neutral, which makes it comfortable for pretty much all hand sizes and all different grips. I really like these micarta inlays. They, um, they really fill the hand, and I like micarta as a handle material. Full titanium with a good and functional deep carry pocket clip and this one comes in at around $550. So hopefully you're not thinking that Chris Reeve knives are way overpriced because you're about to think that I waste a lot of money. But the next one on the list is my newest Chris Reeve knife. This is the Omnanzon. And the Omnanzon is a knife that I've been eyeing for a really long time and I'm really glad that I have it because it just looks so cool. And I haven't got to use it much, but I really like the look of the Omnanzon. It's got S35VN like all of Chris Reeve knives. I like the milling on this titanium. I just, it provides a little bit of extra grip while also just looking cool. And so I think that is good. Also, I like that it has that little bit of lock bar access there that makes it easy to close, not only but just by pushing it like this, but um, if your thumb's sore from opening it or something, you can just use the meat of your thumb, which is pretty cool. Um, I really like the Omnanzon. It's cool how it's kind of a tactical knife, even though I obviously do not need that in whatsoever. I can appreciate it and it is pretty cool. That also has a glass breaker, which I don't need. And the opening is like really quiet because of these uh, rubber O-rings on the thumb stud. As you can hear that, which is also a neat little factor. But um, this one comes in at $450. And on to the next one. I also like the simplicity of the Omnanzon, but on to the next Sabenza. This is my small Sabenza 21 with an Ensingo blade and then just the plain titanium handles. And this is, out of all my Chris Reeve knives, this is the one that I carry the most. I just really like the size of it. I like the small Sabenza because the ergonomics are so neutral. There's a reason I've stayed away from the small and cozy. You know, for all I know, it could fit my hand perfectly, but the small Sabenza, it's very simple. And so I can actually get all four of my fingers on this and it feels like I'm holding on to a large knife and that's good. I've done a bunch of work with this. Then the Insingo blade, what I love about it, as I've said this before, but this drop tip right here gives you the power of a Warncliffe when doing cuts like this. But this sweeping belly here gives you the slicing ability of, of a knife with belly. And so I really like the Insingo blade. It's one of my favorites. The small Sabenza and the plain Jane version, I believe, comes in at around $370. This one is once again an S35V and a titanium. And this Sabenza, I actually... um. I've been meaning to send this in for a spa treatment because I bought it used, uh, but honestly, I haven't been able to keep this thing out of my pocket. I really like it. Um, and if you're wondering what I keep my knives in, I can't really show it on camera because it's kind of big, weird flex, but okay, I guess. But it's a kind of knockoff Pelican case with pick and pluck foam, and I can hold 50 knives in this thing. It's secure, and that's really all I care about. I like it. So the next one on the list is the ZTO562 tie. This knife was my first real premium knife. It's a knife that I really don't carry all that much for certain reasons, but it's still a very good knife. And I would suggest if you're looking into ZTs, look for the 0562 tie, but it's a little bit thicker behind the edge than I would like. That's a big reason why I don't carry it. And the stock is thick pretty much. This knife, it is technically a hard use knife, but it's one of those things where I don't really hard use all my knives and I'm not going to hard use a $280 knife. I'm going to hard use, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to hard use like a $20 knife, but I do have some dedicated hard use knives, which you'll see a little bit later. But the ZT0562 tie, it's got the best action out of any knife 
in my collection and it's got full titanium handle scales a good deep carry pocket clip and it's it's a pretty nice knife and i would suggest it if you're looking into zts also the carbon fiber version is 240 dollars it's a carbon fiber show side scale but it's still the titanium frame lock the next one on the list is the hogue ritter and i really feel like this is one of the best priced knives and you can get some of the best value out of this knife than really any other knives out there especially for made in america value um, and that's something that I really care about it. But it's got 20 CB blade with G10 handle scales. It's very similar to the Gritillion in the way that these handle scales are contoured. It's very thick and it really fills out the hand and is also very comfortable. This knife is actually my car knife. It's one that I just keep with me in the car. And the reason that I do that is that if I forget a knife, I have this one that I'll carry. And for example, uh, a couple weeks ago, the screw on my small Sabenza was loosening up because I didn't tighten it down all the way after I took it apart. And so what I did, I basically just switched out with this knife and I didn't have to worry about losing that screw anymore. And so that's why I keep this knife in my car and also I'll play with it a little bit on break or whatever. But the, um, the Doug Ritter Hogue RSK, whatever, I'm tired of saying the name, but it's about $160 for these good materials and very well fit and finished coming from Hogue. Hogue's a company, keep your eye on Hogue because I think that they're definitely going places in 2021. So the next one on the list is my first Protec, my first real nice automatic knife. This is the Protec SBR. And the SBR is a pretty small knife, but I really like the Les George design. And I'd say this is my favorite smaller knife that I own. I can get all four fingers on it, but it's really one of those where the pinky just kind of rests on this little angled part right here. And so that's not the best, but a lot of times I'm using pinch cuts like this draw cut. So I don't really need to get a full four finger saber grip on this thing because usually this is a secondary carry. I have carried this as my primary in the summer, but the Protec SBR, it's a knife that if you can see this, it was reground. And the reason that I did that was because it was 26 thousandths behind the edge, or actually I didn't regrind it, Alex Steiner ever did. But anyway, it was 26 thousandths behind the edge from the factory. And that's just honestly way too thick for any knife, especially in this size range. I feel like that's like an extremely hard use blade geometry. And to have that on a tiny little pocket knife that you're going to be, or it's not really tiny, but a small pocket knife that you're going to be opening like boxes with, that just doesn't really make any sense to me. And it honestly just feels like a blatant mistake on Protect's part. But now it's 10 thousandths behind the edge. That turned this knife around for me. It cuts like a dream and it's a very good and functional knife. This deep carry pocket clip is done very well. And I really like the Protect SBR. It's also made in America by Protect. The next one on the list is the Hogue Deca. Like I said, Hogue is going places. You should look out for them. And the Hogue Deca is a knife that really got a lot of people's attention because it's kind of Hogue's take on the bug out, just a very lightweight, smaller EDC knife that still is very capable. And this has been a knife that I've really carried a lot with me if I'm going to do yard work or something, because I know that um, if I sweat, it's probably not gonna rust because it's 20 CV on there. That's a pretty corrosive, corrosion resistant steel. And also it is very lightweight in my pocket while still being very capable and very strong with this able lock mechanism. So I really like the Hogue Deca. I feel like it's a very good lightweight knife. I said in my original review of this that the Hogue Deca is a knife that doesn't do anything really good, or no, it doesn't do anything great, but it does everything good, and I still stick by that. You know, the blade, it still cuts pretty good, but it's not super thin behind the edge. The ergonomics, they're pretty comfortable, but it is a little bit thin. The pocket clip, it does function fine, but it just doesn't look the best. And yeah, overall, the Hogue Deca is a knife that doesn't do anything great, but does everything good. And I've been forgetting the prices, but the price on the Hogue Deca is around that $140 mark, I want to say. And then the um, Hogue Ritter is $160, Protec SBR is $180. Next one on the list is the Microtech LEDT. And this is one of my favorite knives out there. Um, probably one of my most highly suggested knives for its price range. It's about $260, but this is made in America with these aluminum scales. And I'll talk about those more. But one thing that I really appreciate about Microtech as a company is they do a lot of things that other companies don't. And I feel like especially the LEDT, this knife was designed by someone who actually knows a lot about knives and really uses their stuff. This is about 10 thousandths behind the edge 
which is just really good and I really like and it cuts very good for that and also the ergonomics are very simple it's just pretty much flat here flat here and what that does is it allows you to pretty much handle it in any grip that you want you can hold it like this like this like this really anything that is pretty much comfortable to you and so that's why this is highly suggested it's probably going to fit any hand size out there unless you have like triple xl huge hands or really tiny hands i don't know but the microtech LUDT it's a great knife perfect edc size and also very um lightweight too and the main issue with this is the springs break but um, I did send it over to Microtech. They have a good warranty. A bunch of people, I don't know what got started about Microtech having a bad warranty, but I had a great warranty experience with them. But anyway, one thing that I like about Microtech is not only that they um, grind their knives thin and have simple ergonomic lines, but they really have attention to detail with knives. I feel like a lot of times in the knife world these days, it seems like companies are just trying to get the knife out there for the absolute cheapest price that they can to appeal to more people. And I don't really think Microtech cares about that. They have a crown spine here, which obviously I don't really need, but it looks really cool. And I guess for the jimping, it kind of smooths it out a little bit, which doesn't make it too aggressive, which I like, you know, it's not really stopping my thumb, but it can be a little bit functional in use. Also, this handle scale has a bunch of work done to it with this milling the milled and jimming, which isn't really sharp at all. And it's also tapered on the aluminum scale, which I think is cool because this obviously takes a bunch of more work to do. Sometimes it just seems like knives, they're putting out kind of G10 slabs with good steel, but they're not grinding it that thin and they're not really paying attention to the details like Microtech does. So I really like that about Microtech as a company. And they're also made in America, which I like too. The next one on the list, is the Benchmade Griptilian. And the Griptilian was one of my first knives and this has been my main hard use knife. As you can see, I have used this knife. I think you can see that. There's a bunch of scratches on this coating. For the things I've done with it, this coating hasn't been horrible. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is like a Cerakote. I'm not entirely sure what coating Benchmade uses, but um, the Benchmade Griptilian, it's a knife that has 100% stood the test of time and it's still going strong. And I really like the Griptilian. The handle scales are very thick, but they're but that is also a good thing. You know, if you're wearing skinny jeans, probably not the best, but they're also contoured and chamfered, which basically makes it very comfortable. It is extremely palm filling, palm filling, sorry about that. And it also feels like holding a fixed blade or something. It feels really good in your hand. My main complaint with the Ergos is that uh, it's kind of, they went overboard with the jimping and especially on the inside here, that gets too sharp since it's plastic. And also it is a little bit thick behind the edge, but I really like this blade shape with the grip tilling. And this is the version with the thumb hole, which makes it more fun to play with. I wouldn't really care if it was a thumb stud or a thumb hole, but I like the grip tilling. And I believe this one is around that $280 price point. So the next one on the list, um, actually let's get into my spider codes. First, the first one on the list is the um, PM2. And the PM2, out of all my spider codes, is probably gonna make a lot of people mad, but um, it's my least favorite. And the reason I say that is because I really like a bunch of my spider codes, but the PM2, it's a solid knife and it's a very good EDC. But the thing is, it's just not that comfortable when you're holding it in your hand. A bunch of people talk so much about how they love the ergonomics of the PM2. And while the ergonomic lines aren't horrible, it's just these scales are so blocky, as you can see. It's like pretty much two slabs of G10. There's maybe a millimeter of a chamfer going along there, but it's not really anything special. And they are completely flat. And so it's just not that comfortable to hold in your hand after a long period of use. And also I do get some hot spots in this forward hammer grip. This hot spot right here with this jimping digs into my hand a little bit. And this backward hammer grip, the hot spot of the compression lock kind of digs in. So the PM2, it's just not my favorite, but you can't argue with um, the popularity of this knife. It's a very good knife, but probably my least favorite Spyderco. And that's saying something about Spyderco because I feel like a bunch of people like to hate on them. And even though I'm not a Spyderco fanboy, I've definitely said a lot of bad things about Spyderco. I feel like they make a lot of good knives. And I feel like every one that I keep getting, I really like, and it's close to one of my favorites. But the next one on the list is the Spyderco Pair 3. And this was one of my uh, first Spydercos, but it's been a knife that I've carried all the time. I've actually pre-ordered this knife. So pretty much ever since it came out, I've had it, used it, and carried it. I did mod it out because I scratched the blade sharpening when I had no clue what I was doing. Also, I have 
um, purple hardware on these handle scales and I think that that looks really good. So I did kind of turn this knife around for me and made me carry it a lot more. But the Pair 3 is a very functional EDC knife. I carried this a bunch during the summer because uh, it's extremely lightweight and it carries great with that deep carry wire pocket clip. Also the Pair 3, it's got all the benefits that you want except the Pair 3 lightweight um, it does have some issues with the construction, like it only has one Foster Bronze washer there. And for that reason, I'm pretty sure that's why mine is off center. It's a little bit hard to see with the dark blade and then the dark background of it. But um, overall, the Pair 3, it's a pretty good knife. I wish that, or I'm really talking about the lightweight, sorry, I keep forgetting to say that. I don't have an actual Pair 3 yet. I assume once I get a deep carry clip for a Pair 3, and I get a pair of three, I guess. I will like it more than the lightweight, but overall, this is a knife that I've carried a bunch and used a lot as well. The next one on the list, this is gonna surprise a lot of you longtime viewers of the channel, and if you're still watching after 15 minutes, you probably really care, and we still got a lot more to go. But anyway, I have my Spyderco Native 5 St. Nick's Knives exclusive in a CPM 4V coated blade with red FRN handle scales. And you guys know that I actually lost this knife a couple months ago. Not this knife, I'll tell you the story. So at work, I lost my Native 5. I uh, don't really know how it happened, and it was just out of my pocket. It's one of the worst feelings in the world. But um, uh, my family knew that I was really bummed about losing that knife. And so for Christmas, they got me a new one. So I really like this Native 5. And honestly, if you're looking for a Native 5, I highly suggest this because the secondary market for these is not crazy or anything i'm pretty sure they got this for um 125 dollars which is exactly what i paid for it and so you're probably not going to get upcharged that much i think i've seen a lot of them go for around that 130 135 mark so i'd highly suggest getting this native five and it's not that hard to get i see them for sale pretty frequently but anyway this saying next native five is one that i really like this is my favorite colorway pretty much ever i feel like the red and black combo just looks amazing and so for that reason, I really like it. Now, coated blades aren't my favorite, but I still, it's honestly worth it because this knife looks so good. But the Native 5, what I like about it is it's very ergonomic compared to knives like the Pair 3. Because um, if you see the Pair 3 here, it has kind of that large thumb ramp. And what that does is um, when you're holding it like this, it feels fine, but I don't use this grip that much. And when you're holding it like this, your thumb feels almost cramped. It wants to go somewhere in here. And so that's where the Native 5 comes in because you can put your thumb here, here, where really wherever you want to. And this back on here is just flat, which is a lot more comfortable. A lot of people don't like the back lock, but personally, I actually kind of like back locks because they're strong, they're functional, and I mean, the Buck 110 was one of the first, or was it the first folding knife ever? I honestly don't know, but it was a back lock, and that thing has been around for a long time, so you can't argue with the results of a back lock, and I think that it is very good, especially on the Spyderco when you can just flick it down to your finger and then easily operate this thing one-handed. I really like the Native 5, and I'm glad to have this one back. Maybe I'll find myself a new one and or no not find myself a new one but find the one that i lost and then i'll have um uh, two of the same knife in my collection but anyway the next one on the list is the spider co gail bradley 2 and the gail bradley 2 is one of my favorite spider co's if you're looking for a spider co that you're really going to use i would gravitate you towards this one because it's got an m4 blade with a simple drop point blade shape it's hollow ground and this thing is about nine thousandths behind the edge and it's just such a good cutter if you're looking for a spider co that's going to be a good cutter get the gail bradley 2 i would highly suggest it also the ergonomics are very simple and it's really good for cuts in this hammer grip saber grip pinch grip really anything that you want to do and so the gail bradley 2 is a knife that i have just used a bunch and I really like it. Are my scratches on here gonna show up? I don't think so, they never do. So you guys probably think I'm lying, but the Gail Bradley 2 is a great knife that I really like. And I would definitely suggest if you're looking for a spider code that you're gonna use, go with the GB2. And one thing about this spider code that I think is interesting and it's kind of weird why I like it so much, is this is not really anything like Spyderco at all. I feel like Spyderco, when I think of the company, you know, you think of the P PM2, Sage 5, Para 3, things like that. And this is kind of out of their comfort zone, but they really nailed it. This liner lock is very strong and solid, and I like that. 
Also, just the M4 blade is really good. And Gail Bradley, um, I'm pretty sure he designed this knife with just pure utilitarian focus in mind. He didn't care how it looked. He didn't care how fun it was to play with. And yeah, it's just a very good knife. You guys are probably tired of hearing me talk about it, but there it is. It's around 170. I hope it's still in stock. If it is, I'd suggest going for it. Um, I'm in like that Spyderco Facebook group or whatever, and I see them for sale every once in a while. So you might want to check that out. I don't think that, the, that that they are that hard to find. Now, like Gail Bradley one, on the other hand, that is a little bit harder to find, at least mint. But anyway, on to the next one, you see it here on your screen, the Sage 5 Lightweight. And this, in my opinion, is the most underrated Spyderco model this is. This knife lives in the shadow of the Pair 3, and I don't really think that it should. It got a bunch of negative hype when it first came out because you know, the name was lightweight and it wasn't that light. And I get that that is kind of frustrating, but this is a very lightweight knife. I've carried this in um, athletic shorts just right next to my pair of three or not at the same time, but they don't really feel any different. And so I really like that about the Sage 5 Lightweight. This is also a knife that I've used a bunch. It's a lot more comfortable in my hand than the pair of three and it does have better um, build quality. It's got two washers with full metal liners, which I really like. Also, this compression lock action, best compression lock action I've ever had out of the box. If you are someone who wants to play with your knife, I'd suggest this or the Spyderco Smock probably. But the Sage 5 Lightweight, it's just um, very smooth and a very functional knife. And I think that the Sage line itself is just a great EDC design with this leaf blade shape. You know, you can still get a full grip on the handle. And yeah, I really like the Sage 5 Lightweight. And if they do sprint runs, sprint runs with it, I could see myself definitely getting multiples. Just, you know, giving my excuse, giving myself the excuse that I need to try out whatever steel is coming in. But honestly, like a K390 or something, I know they don't do that with the Tai Chung plant, but maybe just a Maximet one, that'd be cool. Anyway, on to the next one, the Spyderco Manix 2. Oh, also, I forgot to say, Sage 5 Lightweight is about $120. The Manix 2 is the next one on the list. This is a more recent Spyderco, and I feel like this is one that is going to be one of my favorites. This blade shape, very simple, but one thing that's interesting about it is it's not your average blade shape. It kind of has more belly here and then flat right here, which I really like. I think that it's going to be very functional. Also, the ergonomics, they don't have the big thumb ramp like the PM2 and the uh, Para 3. And also, it's very comfortable. It's very hand-filling. My main complaint is this jimping here. I don't think it's necessary because I don't think this knife is really going to go anywhere in your hand. But I really like the Spyderco ball lock on this knife. And the Manix 2 is a knife I just had my first impressions on. And I feel like I'm really going to like it. I'm thinking about getting some aftermarket scales for it too. Kind of tricking it out. But the next one on the list the Spyderco Military. And the Military, this is a factory second that I got. I know a lot of people get mad when you just say the word factory second because the website was pretty bad, but uh, they are about $200 brand new. And I got this knife with the intent of just making it a pure hard user. And I really haven't had the opportunity to use it that much just because I'm not doing that much yard work or anything. But the PM, or no, not the PM2, the Military, I got this for $78, I wanna say and it is just such a good knife. It lives in the shadow of the PM2, like the Sage 5, or I feel like it's like, there's a lot of underrated Spyderco models just because everyone keeps preaching PM2, Para 3, um, what's the one, Shaman, things like that, and I feel like they have a bunch of better models that you guys should really look into, but the military, a lot of people are just turned away from this knife because obviously it's huge. Uh, I believe it's 9.5 inches in length, also, it's a tip down only, which tip down actually makes sense on this because if you pull it out of your pocket, you're right there ready to go with the flick. Sorry, the action on this is a little bit um, slow, but also uh, if it was tip up, you pull it out like this and then you'd be like, all right, scoot all the way up and then flick it out. But the military, it's a knife. And even though it's huge, it's also pretty lightweight. Like, I think this thing is like 4.2 ounces. I've carried this, and it honestly feels like a Sabenza in your pocket, or like my 0562, or my Hogridder. It's just, it does not feel like a huge knife in your pocket, but it still has the capabilities of being a big knife for use. So I think the military is very underrated. There are a lot of people who have carried a military for years, and really do like it. The next one on the list, this is kind of a huge size difference coming from the military, but the Spyderco Dragonfly. 
This is also a more recent Spyderco that I got and it has really lived in my fifth pocket and I really like it. I actually just posted a video on Instagram, not just posted, a couple days ago of me going through five layers of cardboard with the Dragonfly. It was pretty much all that this blade length could handle, but I can get a full, a full four finger grip. And while the ergonomics aren't that comfortable, you can really put in work with the Dragonfly. And the price range is a little bit too high in my opinion. This K390 one, which obviously is gonna be higher, is about $90 new. I believe the VG10, the standard one, is close to that $60 mark. I don't really know. But for that small of a knife, I think it's kind of overpriced. But personally, I think that the Dragonfly would be a great gift to like a friend who um, doesn't really know much about knives and they can just throw this one in their pocket or something, hardly even know it's there and still get a very good functional tool out of it. So I really like the Dragonfly. I think it's gonna be one of my favorite spider coats and probably one that I own multiple of in the future. Now we are going to the next ones on the list, which actually are my Bally songs. So I guess some people might be interested in this. I'll try and make it a little bit quick though, because I'm not an expert at all on Bally's. But the first one on the list is the Benchmade 51. And the Benchmade 51 was my first real um, live blade Bally song. This one is a little bit pricey at about $280. But this knife, it's got G10 handle scales. It's very lightweight. And if it's legal in your area, it can be a very good carry for you. And so I really like the Benchmade 51. And even though it's not the best flipper and it's I don't really like it all that much for that, I think that it is a great ballet song. And that you guys, um, if you're looking for a ballet song that you're actually going to use and carry, like I said, make sure it's legal. But um, the Benchmade 51 is good and functional for that. The next one on the list is the one that I flip the most. This is a trainer. It is the Squid Industries Squid Trainer version 3.5. And I really like this knife. I really wanted a trainer because um, honestly, a lot of the ballet song flipping I do is not me seriously standing up. Uh, over a soft surface and really focusing on flipping and a lot of it is just me like sitting on the couch with a trainer watching tv and if I had a live blade obviously I it could be dangerous because I'm not focused on really doing the tricks right or whatever I'm just kind of playing around with it but the trainer is very good for that because I like this trainer a lot it's very smooth it's got channeled aluminum handle scales as you can see there, pretty much for you average knife people, it's like a integral on each side. But it also has this micro milling going on it. And I really think micro milling is the way to go for a ballet song because it's not extremely textured like this, but it still provides you some grip if you're doing something like a choker fan, which I just did off camera because there's no way that I'm going to be able to fit this on camera. But I really like the... Um, the what is the name the squid trainer i'll just call it that i think it's a very good trainer and it's around that 200 dollars mark but i think that honestly it's worth it if you're looking for a nice trainer and squid industries they're a company that i think if you're looking to getting into valley flipping look at squid industries they're made in america they have a good price point and i really do like them this one is actually one that looks very bright on my screen right now but this is the squiddy this knife is made out of or not it's really a knife this trainer is made out of plastic it's actually cpvc which is basically just reinforced pvc and this thing has really held up to some abuse a lot of people just think it's cheap but um yeah i have beat this thing up i have flipped this on concrete thrown it over my head dropped it where it falls straight down i've done a lot of things to listen uh this bally song and i really would suggest it maybe the squiddy is a bally that if you're looking to you know uh, maybe be like oh i don't know if i should try out this hobby or not this one is only about 50 dollars, and i think that um, maybe if you get it and you don't like it you have a squiddy with you which you can flip for fun and it really can tell you if you want to get into the ballet song world or not the next one on the list is the Savivi Elementum. And now we are getting into my more budget knives, but the Savivi Elementum is a knife that's kind of swept the world by storm here in 2020. And I personally think it is a very functional, very good sized EDC knife. I believe this blade is right under three inches. It's got a hollow grind, so it gets thin behind the edge. I don't carry this one that much, but I really feel like it's a good knife. I can't really do that much with it, but I suggest Savivi's a lot um, to my family members because the thing is you don't want to get your family member a gift or something and then it have horrible fit and finish or something. That's just kind of like a nightmare in your head for gift giving knives. But Savivi is a company that I've had every single Savivi I've ever owned. Um, I feel like they have really good fit and finish, solid lockup and they're ground thin behind the edge. 
Oh, well, also that Civivi is about $90, but the basic one is $50. Um, the next one on the list is the Civivi Shredder. This one I think I'll give away in my 1,000 subscriber giveaway just because I don't use it or carry it that much. I kind of put a pretty cool finish on it. At least I like to think that. I'm sorry, I don't think it's going to show up, but it's a stonewash finish. And you like can see the satin, but you can also see the stonewash. I don't really know. That's showing up for me there. But um, anyway, the Civivi Shredder, it's a pretty big knife, but it does have good action. It's hollow ground and like 10,000s behind the edge. So Civivi does a great job with these grinds. It is in D2, and I actually own a Civivi Backlash in um, a 9CR, but I sent that over to Outpost 76 for some testing on it, and it's actually performed very well. But anyway, the Civivi Backlash is probably my favorite Civivi. I didn't carry it all that much, but... If I'm ever getting someone a gift for a budget knife and it's in that $40 price range, go with the Civivi Backlash. It's pretty much perfect. The next one, oh, also the Shredder, I think is around $50 and 50 to 60. It's Civivi. One thing I don't like about them is their marketing campaign. I just really despise because what they do is they don't pump out their old models back in stock unless they're extremely popular like the Elementum. They just make new knives, and the new knives are pretty much just like the old knives, just maybe a little bit different. Maybe they change the blade steel, make the handle um, a different pattern of G10. Maybe they get rid of a flipper tab, add a thumb stud. I don't know, but I feel like it's all the same knife, and so that is what kind of annoys me. So that's why I'm probably not really going to get any more Civivis because I feel like the Backlash, their first knife they ever made, is their best one, which really shows you they have not really improved over time while well, there's companies like CGRB who have gone from just a D2 G10 flipper to like having their own new steel with my car to handles, things like that. Anyway, on to the next one. I need to stop rambling because, oh wow, we're already at 30 minutes. Anyway, the Kershaw Leak is the next knife on the list. This one is one of my favorite budget knives made in America, which you don't really get much in this price range, around that 40 to $45 range. 14Z 28 and Warncliffe blade with a aluminum handle scale. It's also, um, this is a knife that when I lost my native, I carried this for like a month because I didn't want to risk losing another nice knife if maybe someone was stealing it or something. I don't know. But the Kershaw League is a great knife that I really like. I'd highly suggest it. And I know a lot of people in real life that aren't knife people that own one. So now I'm going to pull out my CGRBs just because I want to quicken this up a little bit because I don't want this to have to be a huge video that I have to upload. But I do, I guess, have a little bit of a CGRB collection just because they are budget knives, and so I bought a lot of them because they were cheap. But let's just go over them. I have two CGRB Centruses, one of my favorite budget knives out there. I really like it. I like the Backlash a little bit more, but the Centros is still great. The Mini Feldspar, which is pretty simple, pretty good, and the Gobi and the Rampart. These are probably my two least favorite. The Rampart's probably my least favorite because I don't like copper. I think it's a dumb steel, and I think it is extremely overrated. Um, while I'm putting this up, I guess I'll just talk about why I don't like copper. The reason I don't like copper is because um, it's heavy. Um, a bunch of people pick up a copper knife, and they're like, wow, this thing's a beast. Truth is, the truth is copper is a soft metal, and it's not strong at all. It's a lot less strong than steel or titanium, or, um, I mean, not a lot less. It's not like you're going to break copper, but also, it smells horrible. It gives me a headache. Uh, this is probably my second take. I know this is like my third take on this video right now. And the first time I was handling that rampart and I had a headache after. And so I don't like copper at all. It's just, I just don't like it as you heard. Sorry for the little rant. But next one on the list is the CRKT Pete. This one that I kind of practiced my acid etch stonewash finish on because it's like a $25 knife. But the CRKT Pete is actually kind of impressive from CRKT. You know, you got black FRN handle scales that are actually contoured. I feel like this is CRKT's just kind of like maximizing their potential on a knife. Sometimes you'll see them have a great designer and then they just kind of poop the bed, you know? I mean, they just just kind of make, I don't know, I almost feel bad for the designer, his name be on a knife that comes from CRKT sometimes. But Jesper Vox says, I think he should be proud of this knife because even though it's 8CR plastic, it still is pretty good for someone looking for like a $20 knife. And actually, even though it's on Teflon, it's very smooth. A bunch of people hate on Teflon like crazy, even though these probably are not nice um, washers at all. But Teflon is a good washer system. I think more people need to realize that. You'll just hear um, Nick Shabazz say how bad it is, and then you kind of hop on the trend. 
But let's get in um, to the next knife, the QSP Penguin. This is one that I just got, and I actually had some issues with it. The lock failure was atrocious. I guess you could say, I mean, it wouldn't even lock up. It was pretty much like a slip joint. There was like, I could just close it like this with no pressure. I took the thing apart, bent the lock bar back and it's good now, but there is a very weak lock bar tension. Like it falls like this and pretty much just falls closed as well. And look at this, you probably shouldn't do this with your knife, but I just easily, with the strength of my tiny thumbnail, I pushed that thing all the way to like over 100% and there's hardly any lock stick on it. So this liner lock is very poorly done, but the QSP Penguin, it's like, it was the budget knife of 2020 that everyone was yelling about. And if it wasn't for that lock bar issue, this would probably be my favorite budget knife, but it's one of those situations that it's like, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how'd you enjoy the play? You know, one of those kind of things. But now onto the next one, my Boker Strike and my Boker Kalash and Cobb, both in the Desert Warrior Blade HQ exclusive. I don't like this knife, or I don't really like these knives at all. I feel like they're extremely overrated by Blade HQ just screaming them over and over and over because they have a lot of excuses and have a lot of sales. And these knives, they both have a very bad amount of blade play. Um, the Boker Kalashnikov, with I can't get this down to a reasonable amount of blade play. If I do that, um, it won't deploy when it when I actually flick it out. And the Boker Strike, it has a it has so much blade play that you can feel it just by wiggling it and it also um uh what was i gonna say oh yeah it's a free spinning pivot and there is no torx head on the other side so nothing you can do about that so i don't like these knives i would not suggest them i would suggest to stay away from them because they get so hyped up i feel bad for new people who just the only youtube video they ever watch is blade hq and then they get these and then it's just uh, it's not what they expected, I guess, but it is still cool. It's an automatic knife and a lot of people won't be able to get these. The next ones on the list or the last ones are my SOGS and this Buck knife. These are some of my first knives that I don't really like that much. My favorite on here is the Buck. I think it's a pretty cool knife, pretty cool little knife, a good first knife if you were going to get one, but these SOGS, yeah, this was old SOG when they were really bad. Uh, this SOG Zoom, the one on the bottom, this knife has the worst ergonomics, the worst ergonomic lines that you could possibly think of. I don't know who designed this, and I don't mean to be insulting, but I mean to be insulting. Um, it's just, like, I mean, it's got four finger grooves, which I hate because you can only hold it like this. But in the first finger groove, there's a cutout for the spot that the thumb stud goes in. So you can flick it out. And so it's literally just like a hot spot circling around your pointer finger. And it's just very uncomfortable. Also, it's a plunge lock spring assisted knife, which I mean, I guess isn't horrible, but um, it's almost like an automatic that isn't automatic. Like, I feel like what you just need uh, one more spring, I guess, and you can make it an automatic knife. I don't know, but I don't really like this knife at all. Also, this one, this one I carried a bunch. Like, I really, um, I feel like it's a knife that, it's one of those things where you get someone who doesn't know much about knives, a knife, and they'll think it's amazing. I thought this thing was great. Then I realized the ergonomics of it are not comfortable. Also, the tension on this pocket clip is so strong. I thought that I was just doing something wrong, but now that I know and I've seen, like, um, over 40 pocket clips, I guess, this is such a strong tension, it's hilarious. Like, I could not get this over my pants, and let me just try and pry my finger on here. Yeah, that is just, whoa, did I just bend that pocket clip back? I don't know, but my finger is destroyed. I feel like this SOG is, I don't really like SOGs, and I, I mean, I might give them another chance with their new stuff, but it doesn't really appeal to me that much. But that is going to do it for the collection. I will um show my Swiss Army knife here, because I haven't shown that one. But that is it for my knife collection. We are 38 minutes into this. I've talked for 38 minutes straight, and this was my third take of this video because my phone ran out of storage, and the first one I was just not doing very good. But that is going to do it for the video. I hope you guys have a good rest of your year, even though it's January 1st. But um, uh, yeah, I'm glad that uh, I'm done with this video. But thank you guys for watching. If you stuck to the end, thank you very much. I've said thank you a bunch. But we are actually, we have gained a lot of subscribers over the course of this month. I will be doing a dedicated update video for you guys who really care about this channel. But that's going to do it for the video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one.